Welcome back to Know Thy User, a marketing podcast brought to you by Rival Mind, a results driven digital marketing agency. I'm Harley, your host, and today we have an awesome guest here, Amy Parker. Amy has some extensive experience in the retail marketing space and has led major efforts for retailers like Sears, Michaels, Toys R Us, Joanne, and Fresh Time Market. Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Really, I just kind of want to start off our conversation by asking a little bit more about you. I buzzed through a couple of companies you've worked with, but tell me about you. Tell me about your experience. How long have you been doing marketing? Um, I think I've been doing marketing since they invented the printing press. But, um, <laughs> so it's been um, many years, over 25 years in marketing. I actually started my career in finance. Wow. And I quickly learned that my client, the marketing people, we're having way more fun than the finance people. <laughs> yep. So I made the move into marketing at Taco Bell and then moved into retail and have pretty much been in retail and food service my entire career mm. from some big national companies to more regional companies like Fresh Time or Pet Supplies Plus. Um, really looking at how do you build traffic mm. in retail locations and now, of course, on e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. So really focusing on retail because that's your expertise i want to talk about uh, really just start talking about data because mm -hmm. i feel like uh sometimes there can be or at least for some marketers there can be this disconnect between how do you translate maybe online marketing efforts and data collected there to foot traffic in stores mm -hmm. um, and maybe how do you build how do you go about maybe building that database of super helpful data? I know we're going to talk about yeah. loyalty programs and stuff later, but how do you go about building some of that great data to drive traffic in the stores? Well, I think it kind of depends, first of all, where you're at as a company, right? Mm -hmm. From little companies who can do simple things like even punch cards or customer signups to receive our special emails to much larger companies like, of course, Sears back in the day, Toys R Us. Um, where you can collect literally millions of customers' data yeah. and it ends up being very quickly billions of touch points <laughs> yeah. with that customer. So it kind of depends on how much data you have, how much money you have. Mm -hmm. like the first thing is to say, okay, the data is worth something, right? And to believe that you can use that data for something. I came out most recently from uh, a grocery company and many grocers out there collect a, just a boatload of data on their yeah. customers, right? They have 100,000 SKUs in the store. They'll have tens of thousands of customers' transactions a week, start to do those um, calculations, but they don't pay attention to the data. They mm -hmm. don't know how to use the data. They don't know how to leverage the data. The point is to be able to get the data, cleanse the data, use the data to understand what your customers want from you. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to reflect that back to them in messages, promotions, uh, communications that they appreciate and value and that drives them back to the store. It's pretty important to remember that almost all or many searches today or transactions in a brick and mortar store actually start online. Mm -hmm. So being able to track that data and then through a loyalty program, seeing that somebody who started searching for you online is actually walking through the door of your store. Yep, yeah, I had a, a great example of that just last month from me. We, my wife and I, we keep fish, we have aquariums. Mm -hmm. It's a fun hobby, my son loves banging on the glass. <laughs> hey, pet, pet Supplies Plus, yep. great option. Yeah, we love Pet Supplies <laughs> Plus too. Um, and so we frequent PetSmart. We mm -hmm. have, you know, other animals and we're part of their loyalty program. Yep. But what I, you know, it was it popped in my mind when you said showing people what they want to see rather than just like the general e-blast. Yep. Um, we, I was sitting on my couch. It was a Sunday afternoon and I got an email from PetSmart saying, hey, our fish tank and stand combos are on sale 50% off yesterday and today. Mm -hmm. Stores close at nine o'clock. And I was like, oh my gosh, we had been contemplating like getting another fish tank, right. but you know, the investment can be I high. And uh, I was like, oh, I texted my wife. I was like, I just got this email, the sales ending in like four hours. We need to go check this out and see if we want to get it. And sure enough, we were in the store looking at the fish tanks on sale and we walked home with a fish tank that day. Yeah. So it was like the perfect example of, you know, seven years ago when I 
signed up for you yeah. know free dog treats for my yep. dog and then over time i had made purchases for fish tanks and i had done searches on fish and fish keeping supplies and all that and so then it all led up to bam you know it, it ended up being like a 600 hundred dollar purchase overall because of all the supplies and yeah great example all the peripheral mm -hmm. stuff that they ended up getting because of a well-placed email marketing through the data that they had collected on me and so to your point like I it's super interesting to hear you know some of these larger companies mm -hmm. and we have broached broached some of that data it's you know you click and open it up and there's a million different pieces of data to go about what would you say are some of the you know maybe some of the top missed opportunities from companies that have a ton of data that they can go about well I think the first thing is just being able to find it Mm. I mean, it's almost literally in shoeboxes in some places. Sure. Hey, did we put it over there in that closet? No, I think we put it into an access database, didn't we? So where is the data? Yeah. Second, are you keeping it updated and are you cleansing it? Are you mm. really going through those processes, which are kind of boring and require <laughs> marketers to partner pretty effectively with their IT people yeah. or their dig digital agency, if that's who's managing the data. But those are the first two things, right? So you know you've got good, clean, current data. Mm. And then I think the other thing is just figuring out, okay, who visits the store or the website most frequently? Who spends the most money, top line, and then where do we make our money? Who's the most profitable customer? Mm -hmm. PetSmart realizes that you, as someone who keeps fish, you're a very profitable customer for them. Big dollar purchase, very profitable on those items because let's face it, it's not a hugely competitive scrum out there to sell mm -hmm. fish tanks, yep. um, but very infrequent. You probably don't buy a fish tank and a, and a pedestal for right. it maybe once every five years right. or so, yep. or seven years in yep. your example. So understanding what those opportunities are and then starting to understand, gee, it looks like people who keep fish, they tend to buy new aquariums about once every five years. Gee, Harley hasn't bought an aquarium for us for seven, it's a good time for us to start talking to him about something that's really important to mm -hmm. him, right? So it's starting to, again, current, clean data, I can't stress that enough, but then really understand what drives your business. Mm -hmm. Who are these people? And then you can start to append data to those people to say, what do we know about Arlie? Oh, he also keeps companion animals. For those not in the know, that would be ferrets or even reptiles, right? Yeah. Maybe you have those, I don't know. But you know, starting to understand more deeply who you are and then appending third-party data mm -hmm. as well to get to know you a little bit better as a person, demographically as well as psychographically. Yeah. And that just allows you to really continue to hone in on that message about what's important. Yeah. So how would you say, I think uh, analyzing the data on one person or a small subset of people would be, you know, you could tackle that relatively easily. But what happens when you want to analyze half a million purchases over the last six months or whatever it might be like how do you how do you go about aggregating all of that because really then it's about trends because you're not going to say okay these 285 people purchased a yeah. fish tank in the last you know 6 months how do you you know what is what does that look like to start creating trends well probably it requires um, a pretty big data analytics platform right sure. your martech stack has to really be up to the task of doing that and you, if you have data scientists on staff, yay for you, because they're as rare as hen's teeth. Um, but you might need to have a third party partner to sure. help you with that data. And there's certainly a bunch of them out there. You guys probably do some data analysis for your clients as yep, well. Absolutely. But don't discount the fact that you're not out of 500,000 um, transactions. You may get down to a pool of 285 people. But remember, with the ability to dynamically build creative, mm -hmm. you you can get down to one to one, sure. right? Yeah. So I know you bought angel fish, and you bought I don't I know nothing about fish, sure, sure. but whatever those things are, that all of a sudden, looking at that data, it says, oh, you need this special kind of filter, or you need this special kind of food, or or whatever the case may be. Yeah. That's slightly different from your neighbor who lives three doors down who keeps piranha. I don't right. Know. Yeah. Uh, right. So he gets. Yes, it's fish, but it's a little bit different, a little mm -hmm. bit nuanced. Yep. And certainly 
today with the low ever lowering uh, cost of keeping data mm -hmm. and being able to leverage that data and build analytics off of it, don't discount the ability to get down to a one to one mm -hmm. or um, one to few, right? Yeah. So, and yes, the trend stuff is important. And as marketers, we like to look at the trends and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of financial analysis in most retail mm -hmm. companies as well. Right. Um, you know, Walmart yesterday announced their earnings. Yay, Walmart. Um, thank you for keeping the stock market high. Yeah. Um, and what they talked about was their digital customers mm. and who those digital customers were and how much they were driving the grocery business at Walmart. Well, that's pretty important stuff for yeah. Wall Street analysts, as well as within the company to know where to spend your resources. But those kind of big data analytics require, I mean, Walmart, I think, has the largest <laughs> teradata data warehouse yeah. on the face of the planet. It's Walmart's bigger got... than the Defense Department. So they have obviously invested huge amounts oh, yeah. of dollars and people to be able to understand that. You don't have to be that big. And right. there are lots of third parties out there who can really help you do that. Yeah. So let's zero in. I know I want to I know I want to talk about SEO and data and and gathering that, but let's zero in on maybe maybe it's the the uh, marketing director who's the only person on the team mm -hmm. and it's for a mid-size, you know, restaurant franchise and mm -hmm. their job is to create a loyalty program or something that is going to bring return mm -hmm. visitors back to those restaurants. Mm -hmm. How, what have you seen, or at least in your experience, what have you seen has been successful or what does the chain of events look like for maybe restaurant, food service and retail mm -hmm. to get to really be the most effective at getting those people back in the door? Because we've seen everything from point systems to, mm -hmm. you know, buy, you know, buy five drinks, get a six drink free because, you know, the marketing director who's wearing nine hats isn't going to have a third party to help them analyze store traffic and geolocation trends and all of that. Mm -hmm. So what is it like boots on the ground? What do you think it would take to get something like that in place for a, maybe a group of restaurants? So uh, again, depends on the size, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it doesn't take that much because you can start out very simply. Mm -hmm. Let's say you own um, two or three coffee houses, right? Um, and you want to begin to understand your customer. Well, there are lots of ways to find those people and to bring them in to your location. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you how do you do that? How do you build awareness? How do you build consideration and conversion? And then loyalty, yeah. which is the next step yep. on it. And you can do it by simple things, punch cards. I mean, they're not horrible. People have been using them for years. <laughs> you don't remember it, but I remember SNH green stamps, right? Yep. It's a way to build frequency and to keep you top of mind. And the reason you, when you start those programs now, the thing you want to do is get the email address or someone's cell phone number. Mm -hmm. Why? Because email is super cheap. Like the incremental cost of adding an email is virtually zero, mm -hmm. right? And a, an SMS message, same thing. Very, very cheap to do. Yep. And all kinds of systems out there that allow you to set that up. You build a template for your email and all you have to do is dump your email addresses into it and it will automatically send them out yeah. through Cheetah Mail, through MailChimp. So there are lots of very inexpensive, cheap ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is, yeah, you could get um, snail mail addresses, physical addresses for those people. Sure. And that's great too, because now you know exactly where they live mm -hmm. or maybe even where they work in comparison to where your location is. But today, and believe me, I'm a big believer in direct mail. It is not dead, mm -hmm. but it's going to cost you 50 to 75 yep. cents each. Yep to go out. So you really have, you really want to, if you're going to do direct mail, which is more traditional, yeah. you really want to make sure that those are your target customers or previous customers. Right. I don't know that it would be a good idea to send out a mass mailing to people that you're not sure I've ever converted before, but you just happen to have their address somehow. Right. I think direct mail works for when you're trying to build brand awareness really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So grand opening and opening my third coffee shop in yeah. Geneva or St. Charles, right? And I want to let everyone know in a five mile radius that we're going to open on Saturday and we're going to have this great event. Mm -hmm. Direct mail is a great way to do that. Now you want to start to collect email addresses or mm -hmm. phone numbers when they come in. So those people who came to your grand opening, hey, we're still here. 
come in and get your fifth cup of coffee free, you know, whatever it is to start to drive, repeat, visitation, and yeah. keep your brand top of mind. Yeah, love that, love that. So talking about brand awareness in mm -hmm. there, we'll segue into SEO and the mm -hmm. digital sphere because it's, I mean, it's just incredible. <laughs> even in the even in the time that I've been in digital marketing, which is, you know, pales in comparison to the experience you have is it's changed and grown so tremendously, mm -hmm. especially with the pandemic and whatnot. Yep. Um, so brand awareness through SEO, how important would you, I mean, we shout it from the rooftops constantly <laughs> because that's how our business grows, but from somebody who is a veteran in the space, from small to medium to enterprise level companies, how important would you say SEO investment in a company is? I think it's critically important. It may be your number one marketing spend that you should be thinking about. Wow. Um, at least in my opinion, number one search in the world is blank near me, coffee shops near me, gas station near me, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, that's the number one search that people are looking for. So how do you show up there? Well, you can show up through SEM and you pay for it, right. which is not terrible. You're going to show up in the top three or four, right? But you also want to show up in that uh, three pack, right? Yep. That shows up the second part down. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely need to be there and it's showing your map and it's, you know, it'll have a little thing about your reviews and all those kinds of things. Yeah. And if you aren't actively pursuing that, driving that, managing that, A, you're not going to show up. Or B, you're going to show up for some bad things yeah. that you do not want to be associated with. <laughs> right. So it's it's both a positive and a way to make sure nothing negative is out there about your brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, SEO and search engine reputation management go mm -hmm. hand in hand. And really, as the business owner or the marketing person, you have the ability to have your hands on the pulse. Mm -hmm. I mean, for Rival Mind specifically, yes, we've got our Google business profile mm -hmm. and we have reviews there. We also have our clutch.co, which is a profile that's only for um, digital agencies mm -hmm. and we have up city and we have and so really it's how are you managing the perception of your brand online in addition to investing and showing up so from the perspective of marketing dollars one of the things that we have come across and we're primarily in the business to business space yeah. is businesses are critically underspending on marketing in general and so how do we how do we better con not convince how do we better illustrate the importance of uh, digital marketing marketing in general and then more specifically SEO SEM to a smaller company that is more hesitant to uh, invest in mm -hmm. something that is seemingly intangible like SEO. Well, see, I, I guess I, I disagree with the, the premise that it's intangible, right? Sure. First thing you do is you sit down and say, well, how would you describe your business? Oh, we're in the business of uh, printing signs. Okay. Sign printers near me. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. <laughs> we, you guys are like on page five. Look at who's up here on the top. Yep. These are your competitors. Are you comfortable with that? Let's look at the search volume for sign printers mm -hmm. in this area, right? Look, there's a thousand searches a day. How many of those would you like to get, right? Yeah. So it becomes very tangible, right. very real. And it also requires a commitment to an investment in the website mm -hmm. and content on the website. Yep. I'll give you an example. When I uh, arrived at Fresh Time, they were a very young company mm -hmm. and our website was a flat website hmm. it was it was just a some words on a page <laughs> picture of a butcher um and i remember i hadn't been there very long and our ceo came walking down the um aisle and stopped in my office on a monday morning he goes how come we don't show up and search for organic romaine lettuce i know <laughs> we have organic romaine lettuce and i'm like i'm guessing at this point that we do not have organic romaine lettuce on our website yep. at all. Yep. And we didn't. And you started looking at that and you started explaining to him that it isn't an accident that you show up on search, right? Google has to go out and be able to find these search terms, these keywords. Yep. And if you don't have them on your website, if you don't have the content that talks about who you are, what you stand for, what your special sauce is, if mm -hmm. you will, you're not going to show up. Yep. And that's fine. There are other ways to drive awareness, 
to drive consideration and conversion, yep. they just tend to be a little more expensive. Yeah. I'm not saying SEO is cheap because it's it's not yep. building those things, but those are investments that are gonna continue over a long period of time. Yep. SEM is a way to get there quickly, right? Yeah. But boy, if you can if you can start with SEM and be building your SEO at the same time, and then you can start to taper on your SEM, I think that's the perfect combination. You're speaking my language. <laughs> Because I sit on I sit on both sides of the fence, and so I I love it when I can come into a room. I just spoke with a, a local business yesterday. They're a med spa, and you know uh, Matt came in and said, "Hey, can you talk to these ladies about mm -hmm. SEO and PPC?" And I was yep. like, "Sure, SEO is a long term play. Yep, you know if you've got twenty thousand dollars a month to spend, we can probably make something happen in mm -hmm. a couple months just because of the sheer volume of work we could do. Yeah. But if you don't," It's going to be six months, 12 months, maybe because of the industry that they're in. Yeah. Um, and so we, I said the, the alternative to speed it up while we're working on SEO is go buy visibility mm -hmm. for those top keywords, microblading, Hoffman Estates. You mm -hmm. want to show up for that? Great. It's $3.87 a click. Yeah. The painful portion is when you pay that $3.87 and it doesn't turn into something right. because then you can immediately see, oof, I, you know, that's four bucks out of my pocket. Yeah for that thing and when it comes to yeah we're trying to capture 5000 eyeballs a month on these things it can really start to add up. Well, and I think the other piece and, and that's another great example is that it doesn't just stop with the search. You're talking about lead generation, right? Mm -hmm. So, and believe me, I'm a cynic about customer journeys. I don't want to make up personas <laughs> yeah. of of people who don't exist and I mean, it's like just be smart and think about it. But understanding the journey of what a consumer is going to go through. They, they see your ad, they click on it, what happens? Mm -hmm. Or they see your ad, they don't click on it. Why didn't they? Mm -hmm. Right? And then if they click on it, what's the next thing that happens? Right. Oh, it sends them to a contact form or it sends them to a call center. Okay, what happens? How are you converting on each of those things? Yeah. How long does it take you to respond? What are you hearing from people when they book versus when they don't book? Mm -hmm. Those are all important steps in the process too. And they're equally important because you just paid four bucks. Yeah. Right? You want to <laughs> convert that into a paying customer. Yep. Yeah. We we oftentimes, and this is, this is a concept that uh, is surprisingly unheard of to a lot of people that I talk to in mm -hmm. our space. Using, so SEO, when you're creating those top of funnel, um, articles to mm -hmm. drive traffic, you know, how how much milk should I feed my toddler yeah. every day because I'm writing something on parenting for a company who's doing, you know, parenting classes or what have mm -hmm. you. We're answering common questions and problems mm -hmm. to drive people to using the sheer volume because we could write an article that drives 500 visits a month right. using then something like Google Analytics, br uh, cookie browser tracking to then say, Anyone that's come to our website in the last 90 days, we want to use them in an audience and then go out and either pay to show them mm -hmm. advertisements based on the blog that they read right. or show them advertisements based on how, maybe how long they were on the mm -hmm. website or remarketing. One of the things that we always talk about in business to business is on average, it takes about seven touch points with a company to get an action to be taken. And mm -hmm. so we talk about what are what are those touch points and how do we create those mm -hmm. touch points on a budget with our clients? You know, one would be through Google Ads. You pay for that first mm -hmm. one because it's going to land. Second one then is through SEO. The third one is through maybe a, a mailer or um, a text message or an mm -hmm. email because you've got them on that list. Right. And you basically it's relationship building, at yep. least in the business to business world proving to that customer that you have one, what it takes to partner with them yeah. and two, what it takes to serve them in the way that needs to be served. And I think uh, in the business to consumer world, I think consumers are a little bit more cold even than businesses are <laughs> because there's so much more opportunity to, I don't like the flavor of this coffee. Right. I'm going to go down the street and yeah. get, get the one that I like. And so really B2C companies have to really know their customers a lot more because you kind of have like a one shot 
or maybe a couple shots to get that person's attention and really draw them in to build that loyalty mm -hmm. or to get them to convert that first time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess out of that rambling, my question would be how in the data that you've seen, how many touch points do you think you would have to create to really get a return customer? And obviously it fluctuates with the company. Well, I'm not sure about return customer, but to get the consumer to take an action, mm -hmm. it's about five. Okay about five touch points um, and it depends on what those touch points are in retail often it's promotional messaging mm -hmm. right so you get a weekly ad or you get um, Toys R Us used to do the big toy book yep. um, that would out whatever those touch points are they have to really be connecting with the customer on a number of levels promotion is important it, in retail it, it is it drives traffic wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if it didn't yeah um, but there's a reason Black Friday exists yep. um, but then there's also, well, I don't necessarily want just the cheapest. Maybe I do, but I also want to know something about your quality. I want to know sure. something about the size of your assortment. What can I expect when I get there? What are you best known for? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you fit with my lifestyle? So creating a relationship, you talked about that, how important that is in business, in business to business marketing. It's really important in B2C marketing as well. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do is create a relationship. And I think almost by the nature of the transaction, it's gonna be a little more superficial than mm -hmm. in a business to business. Sure, you aren't gonna sure. have an account executive talking to every customer, but you probably have operations people in your store, yep. servers in your restaurant, and the idea that you want to create that relationship with them. I can remember when Starbucks was very young, when mm -hmm. they had baristas who actually were pulling shots. <laughs> Just saying. Yep. And they knew your name. Yeah. They knew your drink and they knew your name. And that, are you going to have a, you know, a quad venti latte today? Yep. And, you, you know, you're like, yes, yes, I am. I'm going to have that today, right? <laughs> yep. Okay, Amy, we'll get that for you. And yep. it's like, I'm never going to go anyplace else. Mm -hmm. the, and then know. because you're not thinking about ordering, you're like, you know what? While they're doing that, I think I'm interested in yeah. this thing too. Exactly. And you do kind of, and you when you go into the store, then you're kind of looking for that person. Yep. Maybe you have a favorite cashier, yep. you know, oh, yeah. somebody that you really like. Or at PetSmart, maybe you have a sales associate who really gets what you're into, is really the, the fish expert in the store. You yep. know, Lowe's and Home Depot used to do that by having um, professionals, um, carpenters and plumbers and yep. electricians who worked there yep. and could really answer your questions. I think maybe they've fallen off that a little <laughs> bit, but, um, and that's how you create relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I spent the first portion of my career, I spent, uh, in the food service industry. Mm -hmm. So my degree is actually in pastry arts. So I- <gasps> I love you. Yeah, so <laughs> culinary all the way, 15 hours a day on the, my feet in the kitchen yep. is where I started. And then I went into restaurant management and yeah. that was where I really got to see the interaction from business to consumer best. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously in the kitchen, I loved like creating something that was delicious and mm -hmm. that drew people back yep. um, constantly because they would come for whatever I was putting on the menu next. But from the managerial perspective, like encouraging my team to really understand and know their customers and the regulars that we had that would come. I mean, these people are spending a ton of money yeah on the regular with businesses because the relationships are being built and it's cool to be able to use other marketing um, efforts, SEO, direct mail, email, text, all of those to bring new eyeballs and then having a team in-house that's ready to you know, create that loyalty, create the relationship to bring new people back is super, super cool. Yeah, and I think it's it's recently come up a lot, at least on my LinkedIn feed, um, where people are talking about how critically important it is for leadership in a retail food service company, I'm sure even in business to business or especially in business to business, but that leadership understand what the people in the field, the people in the store, the people in the restaurant, what you're asking them to do what they're doing mm -hmm. and how they're doing it and to really connect with that. And I, I can't tell you how many places I've worked where leadership never went out to the stores. Mm. I was like, it was almost like, well, you know, store people. I was like, no, I, last time I looked, as we like to say, there are no cash registers at headquarters, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So we're all just expense yep. in the P&L. Yep. So you have to be able to go out and work 
in the stores, work with the people, talk to those people, Yeah. right? Because they're making it happen. They are the moment of truth. Mm-hmm. We used to, at Fresh Time, um, and at, at Topps Markets way back, or Toys R Us, we would work in the store on Black Friday. Or in grocery, it's actually the days leading up to Thanksgiving, yeah. which oh, are yeah. insane. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> um, you, go out, you go out, you catch carts out of the parking lot, you wipe the floor because it's always snowing, um, whatever. Whatever they needed mm-hmm. to make it easy for the store operations people to be able to take care of the customers. And I think that's missing today. I think yeah. maybe because of digital, it's, um, it, it's sort of at a remove Yep. from one step away from the actual human interaction. And, you know, there's a lot of talk lately, you know, 90% of retail is still done in stores. Well, yeah, it's about human interaction. Yep. And so if you don't understand that or understand that journey and each step that, that you're asking the consumer to take with mm-hmm. you and who's going to deliver it, Yep. right? Um, I, I think you're going to lose. You're going to spend a whole bunch of money <laughs> yeah. on a great website, great content, SEO, SEM, print, whatever you're doing, TV. And then the uh, consumer walks in and goes, where's the beef? Yep. Right. There's, there's no there there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's super, it's super interesting to see how the market has shifted and how companies have done a great job of taking advantage of how the market shifted. But, you know, by our COO, he just loves people interaction. And that's why, you know, Rival Mind does hybrid work because mm-hmm. um, the team interaction face-to-face, getting around a conference table with with people face-to-face mm-hmm. and hammering out issues and coming up with a plan and strategy, it's so effective. And it translates to, it translates to consumers too. So utilizing all that we now know about the digital space and using it to drive consumers Mm -hmm. to your people for face-to-face interaction, I think is like the impetus for real growth because the face-to-face interaction will continue to be an excellent and probably the primary source of sale for a long, long time. And so being able to use that information is just something that is uh, critical, I would say. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, I was just thinking about you know, the robots that they're now using at McDonald's to yep. make French fries and <laughs> make your cheeseburger or whatever. Well, that that's okay because I'm not even sure I want to think about necessarily who's making. I just want to be right. I yep. want to meet my expectations and I want to be fast. But then how is McDonald's uh, reinvesting those dollars in better customer service, yep. better quality product, faster service, people who are better able to connect with you at that counter. Yep. Um, you know, I think it just it could easily become a misstep. It's like, oh, look, we saved three cents uh, on every Big Mac because we're using this robot. Yep. Okay, I guess that's good. But if you're not investing it back into the consumer, that's a real problem. Yeah, man. So much awesome information. So I I think we're actually out of time, Um, but it's been fantastic to have you here talking about your experience, talking about your insights. I think we've just provided a ton of excellent information. So thank you so much for joining us and thank everybody for listening. Thank you all for listening. I'm your host, Harley. Join us next week for another excellent marketing conversation.